It was a war on gays. It was an effort to silence them, to ruin their lives. They said, we don't want you. We don't like you. You sicken us. We think you're sex deviants. You can't get away with it. This is the government. They're coming at me, and I had nothing. And the FBI's around asking if I'm gay. And it really terrified people. This is not ancient history. This is something in my life. We get up in people's attics, and we find the original papers that tell the story of how gay men and lesbians have interacted with the White House. Charles Francis is on a mission. Six presidencies talking about gays as immoral, scandalous, nasty, uh, and needing to be investigated and fired. It was one president in particular, once a close friend, who set him on this course. My brother and my whole family are longtime friends of the Bush family. Francis was a well-connected Republican PR man. In 1998, he made a difficult personal decision. We have a family fishing place in East Texas, and the Bushes, George W. Bush and his family at that time, had a small house on that lake. You remember casual, wonderful conversations and meals, and um, came to know him in a relaxed setting. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should come out to him. February 16, 1998. Dear Governor, as a strong friend and supporter with family-like kinship, I have thought long and hard about ways I might be of help to you and Laura in the coming year. I thought, you know, I can put a personal human face on being gay. Within a couple of days, Governor Bush called back. He said, I always knew you were gay. I just didn't know how to bring it up. But now that you have, I would love to hear your ideas. That exchange sent Francis on his first mission, emissary to the gay community as the governor was preparing to run for president as a compassionate conservative. Soon enough, Francis was plotting strategy with Bush's political guru, Karl Rove. I'm sitting in Carl's library, and Carl takes out a piece of paper and goes, now look, these are the states where we think gay support could be most helpful. This section of working class Catholics in this region of this state, places where a gay voice could help. So that's sort of where the idea of the Austin 12 was hatched. The Austin 12, a dozen gay Republicans handpicked to meet with Bush in what was billed back then as a game-changing event. The Republican presidential candidate George W. Bush met with a group of gay Republicans today. Mr. Bush has been avoiding gay groups until now. I'm a better person for the meeting. I enjoyed it. I thought some of the life stories were very compelling. The sincerity with which he wanted to continue this dialogue was unbelievably strong. What I shared with him was that I had been in a relationship for then 17 years, that uh, we were both accepted and celebrated by both of our families. Everybody had their ideas. So say you're not going to discriminate. Say that you're going to have some gay appointees. We need an openly gay appointee. I immediately called my parents. And I said, you know, I would do anything to get this man elected. Well, I say to them, I welcome gay Americans into my campaign. We judge people based upon their heart and soul. That's what the campaign is about. And while we disagree on gay marriage, for example, we agree on a lot of other issues. We see overnight tracking polls show that this meeting had an impact. So this was a big deal. It was a historical moment, and a historical moment that's been forgotten. But from the outset, there were omens. Bush had promised an openly gay speaker at the Republican convention. History and providence have blessed America. But even that small gesture drew a protest. 
So I'm sitting there with my family in like the third row of the convention hall, and all of a sudden, a lot of the members of the Texas delegation start praying for Jim Colby's soul because he's gay. It was sickening to be seated in that. Thank you. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. After Bush takes office, there was progress. I remember uh, a note I got from Carl saying, hey, we're going to name so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. These are gay people, and this is really great news. Then, boom, storm clouds. In February 2004, with the presidential campaign already in full swing and the Republicans worried about re-election, the president makes an historic announcement. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. If we're to prevent the meaning of marriage from being changed forever, our nation must enact a constitutional amendment to protect marriage in America. Everyone was really stunned. And then at the same time, the campaign started working in all of the states with constitutional ballot initiatives on gay marriage. The history has shown us that a marriage between men and women have served society well. It became the issue. Marriage has been one man and one woman since before North Carolina was a state. It's what God created to give children a mother and a father. Vote for the Marriage Protection Amendment. So they then put referenda on the ballots in a number of states, like Ohio. What happens is that's helpful to them in turning out their vote. As you were watching the 2004 campaign unfold, they're using this issue. Oh, yeah. Gay marriage. What was your reaction as you watched that? Uh, anguish, quiet anguish. Uh, I didn't handcuff myself to the White House fence. Bans on same-sex marriage passed in all 11 states where they were proposed. But the facts are we failed. The voters turned out in record numbers and delivered an historic victory. You have to be ready to get thrown overboard. And we were. These anti-same-sex marriage laws would be a turning point in the battle over gay rights and years later would become the target of a historic Supreme Court challenge. As the years go by, I realize it was part of a larger historic problem that gays and lesbians have when they're dealing with the American presidency. Francis left the Republican Party, got married, and revived a gay rights organization dedicated to digging up a forgotten history of America's war on gays. What's probably the most shocking thing that you found. Millions of federal workers, we got their files. And the files show a degree of animus over decades that is astounding to behold. Animus embedded in the federal government. Also buried in the files were heartbreaking stories of vicious and ugly betrayals dating back to the darkest days of the Cold War. if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. The 50s, Americans are gripped with fear of communists. But there was also hysteria over what was portrayed as an equally sinister infiltration of government. Homosexuality was considered such a horrible thing in that uh, decade. If they discovered a gay person in government, could blackmail them into betraying state secrets. Now, there was never, ever any evidence whatsoever that anybody was ever blackmailed, but that didn't matter. June 20th, 1951. Upon the receipt of an allegation that a present or former employee of any branch of the United States government is a sex deviant, such information in all cases should be disseminated. While digging through government archives, Charles Francis came across a stunning document, shown here for the first time. We get J. Edgar Hoover's Sex Deviant Program memo of 1951. For us, it was an aha moment that we've got J. Edgar Hoover in our sights, and we're seeing him provide his brand of sick, obsessive focus on gay America. Each supervisor will be held personally responsible to underline in green pencil 
the names of individuals who are alleged to be sex deviates. Very truly yours, John Edgar Hoover. He's instructing his people to become plants in each arm of the federal government to identify potential accused homosexuals, report back to him, and then let them investigate. The plants were also instructed to leak the names of gays, in some cases anonymously, to their employers. In terms of FBI abuses, this ranks at the top. Doug Charles is the author of a new book, Hoover's War on Gays. It was an effort to silence them. It was an effort to ruin their lives. Because if you were exposed as gay in the 1950s or 1960s, your life as you knew it was over. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Lester C. Hunt, United States Senator from Wyoming. Very important that America knows what happened to Lester C. Hunt. Out of the shadows, after 60 years, Lester Buddy Hunt Jr. is finally telling the tragic story of his father for the first time on camera. He certainly projected an honesty and a forthrightness about his position. He's proud of the legacy of his father, Lester Hunt Sr., a dentist, a popular two-term Democratic governor of Wyoming, then elected to the Senate in 1948. If you had to sum up your father as a public figure, how would you do so? Well, I think the, the, the best way is he thought that there should be certain moral principles, basically, that led people in office to behave in certain ways. Let's keep the thing in proper perspective. A fellow senator that Hunt did not believe lived up to those ideals was Joe McCarthy. Well, he just didn't like the guy. I've been in, actively in public life for 22 years, and to the best of my knowledge, I never met a communist. He objected to the, the, the way which McCarthy treated the people that he was after, which he thought was both unfair and not decent, and that he was witch hunting. McCarthy had informants everywhere, and when young Hunt had an encounter with the law, it became an event to be exploited for political gain. They were patrolling the area to arrest people. That was the purpose, to pick up gays. It was a June evening in 1953, and Hunt had gone to Lafayette Park, across the street from the White House. Law enforcement had created something called the Pervert Elimination Squad, and they were waiting there that night. About 600 undercover officers who would go out into the community, to the bars and the restaurants and the parks, to make eye contact with males and arrest them. These were undercover officers. Yes. Posing as gay men cruising. Cruising, right, yeah, yeah, and available. I got into conversation with a guy there to whom I was attracted. Were you gay? No. I don't think I knew what I was. And this was an experiment. Made it clear. Yes, that he was available. I wanted to proposition him, and I did and then he arrested me. Took my fingerprints and let me go. Did you tell your dad? No, didn't say a word. I guess I didn't want to face that with him. And I figured it, they didn't seem very serious about the arrest. And I thought, you know, it'll blow over. Initially, the US attorney and the arresting police officer made the decision that the charges should be dismissed. Papers unearthed in recent years by Wyoming historian Roger McDaniel document what was whispered about at the time. Two senators, Stiles Bridges of New Hampshire and Herman Welker of Idaho, both allies of McCarthy, accused the DC police of taking a bribe to let the senator's son off. They demanded he be prosecuted. Basically, pressure from the Senate forces the Washington prosecutors to take you to trial. It was clear, I think, in everybody's mind that some kind of pressure had been used. In October, Hunt went to trial. His father sat next to him and watched as his son was convicted. The charge here is one of the most degrading that can be made against a man, declared the judge. 
he was sentenced to 30 days in jail or a $100 fine. My father paid the fine. Then and there, he had cash in his pocket. He was ready. Those who knew the hunts then watched them every day at the trial. They said you could visibly see them age. Lester Hunt's hair went from brown to gray nearly overnight. He became a recluse. He would not even eat lunch in the Senate cafeteria. I know that Mrs. Hunt, who had destroyed her, but he couldn't have handled that. He was just, uh, he was a gentle giant of a guy in my personal memory of him. But McCarthy's allies, Bridges and Welker, weren't through. It was my belief at that time that the Republicans would use everything they could against my father. With control of the Senate at stake in the 1954 election, they threatened Senator Hunt. They were going to canvas every house and every town they could and tell them a story and tell them what's going on in the Hunt family and, you know, this kind of stuff. They were pressuring your father... Not to run. In these unpublished notes from 40 years ago, Senator Hunt had told a close friend they were blackmailing him, threatening that 25,000 pamphlets about his son's arrest would be mailed to Wyoming voters. Joe McCarthy and Stiles Bridges and uh, the other senator began to tighten the screws on Hunt because they knew if he wouldn't run, the Republicans would take over the majority of the U.S. Senate. Under excruciating pressure, Senator Hunt went to his office on a Saturday morning with a rifle. A shot rang out. Senator Hunt had killed himself. That just passes all bounds of decency. That is absolutely beyond the pale of politics. It's a. It, it's just a couple of sons of bitches doing evil things like out of Macbeth. I think they were assholes, I mean, bastards. I mean, you know, it's the kind of political activity you just don't engage in. Lester Hunt Jr. moved to Chicago, got married, raised a family, and became a community organizer. The story of what really happened was covered up for years, but it inspired a Washington reporter, Alan Drury, to write a blockbuster novel, Advise and Consent, later turned into a popular Hollywood movie. In Drury's story, a senator is threatened by political rivals over a homosexual affair in his youth, prompting him to commit suicide. He's dead. Break in his office. Cut his throat. Well, come on in. Don't just stand there. For decades, this depiction of the shame of homosexuality, including a memorable scene from the movie Inside a Gay Bar, scarred a generation of those in politics who were still in the closet. I was at that time a gay man who knew I was gay, who was interested in politics, who was so intimidated by the unanimous prevailing contempt for gay people that I didn't think I would ever be able to tell anybody. And if I ever had any doubt about it, reading this book, I really drove it home. You can ask any gay man who's sort of my age, what did you think when you first saw Advise and Consent? It's almost too much. I needed money, Rick. You as the gay man are treated as subversive, potentially treasonous, insane, and uh, damned. One of the key documents that Charles Francis uncovered was a long forgotten tale of a low level bureaucrat fired from his job in 1971 when the government discovered he was gay. In view of the above described immoral, infamous, scandalous, and notoriously disgraceful conduct, you are invited to show cause why you should not be disqualified for federal employment. Charlie Baker was the victim of government policy that barred gays from working for the federal government.
I was so determined then. I was not going to let somebody else's bigotry or their hatred. I wasn't going to let that stop me. I just couldn't. I ask the American people for a mandate to begin. In the closing weeks of the 1964 election, the White House is shaken by scandal. I don't think there's any question what's going to be a bombshell and be the issue in this campaign. No. President Lyndon Johnson has just learned that one of his top aides, Walter Jenkins, had been arrested for having oral sex in a YMCA bathroom. It's just a question of a sick man. Yeah. It just shocks me as much as it does if my daughter committed treason. In this climate, there was a new crackdown to ferret out gays. A top official of the U.S. Civil Service Commission wrote, In evaluating cases of homosexuality, we automatically find the individual not suitable for employment unless there is evidence of rehabilitation. Some feel once a homo, always a homo. This memo is one of the biggest finds that Charles Francis and his team have discovered. This is a federal government paper by an attorney writing about gays as nasty and immoral. And this is the basis of 60 years of federal persecution. Just in case anybody missed the point. What it boils down to is that most men look upon homosexuality as something uniquely nasty. It didn't even matter so much whether you were actually gay, even if you were suspected of being gay, perceived to be gay, or at some time engaged in same-sex conduct. That was enough because of this, this notion, once a homo, always a homo. It was this policy that nearly destroyed Charlie Baker. He had joined the Navy as a teenager and had a job at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. So you were the dental technician for the White House. Oh, yeah, House. for a 20-year-old kid, that was exciting. It was President Johnson then, so when he needed us, they would send a limousine out to the hospital and pick us up. But that all changed when Baker was transferred to the USS Norfolk. We were getting ready to go overseas for a year, and I just thought, you know, I don't think I could can do this. So I went and said, you know, I, I'm gay. And at that time, it was, you know, you're out the door. You were openly gay at the time? Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much, actually. <laughs> he got a new job as a clerk typist at the National Bureau of Standards, only to get a surprise in the mail. And you open up the letter, and you find this. Yes. You had been engaged with each other in homosexual activities, including caressing sodomy, latio, anal intercourse, mutual masturbation, and rubbing the penis on the body. What really made me angry was they had all this power and they had all these people involved in this, and they were coming after me. I mean, you know, just little me. It was not fair. It was very unfair. I had nothing. I, did, I didn't know where to turn. So Baker turned to Frank Kameny, then the country's preeminent gay rights activist. Kameny, an astronomer, had been fired from the Army Map Service for being gay. Now he was waging a lonely campaign, arguing that the government had no right to fire anyone based on their sexual orientation. I went to him, and he took it and ran with it. I have been involved with the gay movement since 1961, and very quickly one of the issues that what you might call government versus gays. Kameny fired off letters, blasting federal officials for their contention that Baker's employment was disruptive to the federal workforce. We look upon these statements as the mere implementation of the ignorance, misinformation, and entrenched bigotry of a group of men holding archaic, obsolete, outmoded, and obscene ideas. He didn't pull his punches. Did he? <laughs> he didn't. Baker sued the government, and in December 1973, won. A federal judge concluded he could not be fired without evidence that his sex life had anything to do with his job performance. You beat him. Yes, yeah. You were vindicated. Yes, I was. That was a very good feeling. It was one of the first rulings granting the rights of gays to work for the government. 
but Baker was always surprised his victory didn't get any attention. Every now and then I do a search on, you know, the court case, and, and I could never find anything. And I, and, and I thought, well, I guess, you know, 40 some years it's probably just been forgotten, which I thought was a real, you know, a real shame that it would have. But Baker's story and the documents Francis and his team from the law firm of McDermott, Will and Emery are uncovering serve as stark reminders of the officially sanctioned bigotry against gays. How much do you think the Supreme Court is really going to grapple with that issue? That bias, or animus, they argue, is what lurks behind same-sex marriage bans and why they need to be overturned. Number one, we connect the dots. Number two, we provide these documents to the justices. We give them the evidence of animus. To see something so hateful in black and white, no hesitation whatsoever about putting that in a document. That we are going to have a program in the United States that is going to target citizens who are quote unquote sex deviates and make sure that they are not employed by the federal government. That in black and white is absolutely shocking to me. We kept talking to the American people, and 15 years later, we've won the argument. And this same-sex marriage discussion today proves it. We deserve the same respect as any other couple. Hopefully, we're on the right side of history, and our kids will now have equal protection. Thank you. Baker didn't wait around to see how the Supreme Court would rule. In April, he and his partner Rod, together for 35 years, took their vows in a double wedding ceremony in Florida. A gay couple. In the name of love, I, Rod. Choose you, Charlie. Choose you, Charlie. Getting married next to a straight one, recognized equally under the law. One thing that is no secret, is I love you and look forward to many, many years together. <laughs> it's pretty exciting to go from thinking that had died and gone away and think that now it, it's part of the fight. What we're looking for is the real life damage he did. Thank you.